Sylvanus is concerned with maintaining the balance of nature throughout the realms. Expansion and development needs to be checked all the while preserving the wild places held so dear by his faith. I am Ben Dignan, and welcome once again to Religion in the Realms. With Sylvanus, we get to tackle how a deity from two or more separate pantheons operate functionally in D&D canon. For those of you who have listened to the Ogma and Tyr episodes in the past, I'm going to be given the same overview I did at the start of those episodes, so feel free to skip ahead a couple minutes. A few deities from the Faerunian pantheon come from other pantheons. Each one of these deities exists in a pantheon from our real-world religions that have polytheistic beliefs. Ogma and Sylvanus are Celtic deities. Loviatar and Mailiki are Finnish deities. And Tyr is a Norse deity. Each of these deities is classified as an interloper deity, compared to that of native deities. Native deities of the Forgotten Realms are those that were around during the creation of Toril, like Shantia or Shar, or arose sometime after during the timeline of Toril, like Torm or Siric. An interloper deity is a deity who is worshipped on another plane or material world until their presence and influence was brought through to Toril via their worshippers or other means. To the vast majority of people on Toril, they aren't aware of such things or would even concern themselves with such a categorization, though theological scholars are interested in such a delineation. The five deities I listed earlier are included in this category alongside the racial pantheons like the Drow Pantheon, as I have covered in the past, or the Orcish Pantheon, just as some examples. Interloper deities were allowed into the crystal sphere of realm space presided over by Ao for a long time. That was until Ao began pu- putting up the formal boundaries around what entity could exist as a deity in realm space. Now here is where the canon conflicts a bit. In the third edition supplement Face and Pantheons, it says that the aspect of a deity in Toril is independent to that of the aspect of a deity on another plane or world, which I can agree with somewhat. As I will talk about further into the podcast, Sylvanus as he exists in the Celtic Pantheon is remarkably similar to Sylvanus as he exists in the Faerunian Pantheon. This is different from what was described about Tyr and Ogma. So, should someone ever truly meet Sylvanus, it would seem it really does not matter which version of him you are meeting. However, the issue I take with what the supplement says is that if a team of adventurers native to Toril were capable of reaching Tirnanog in the Outlands and slaying Sylvanus, only the Toril aspect of Sylvanus would die. That means, in some mystical way, which I will admit definitely fits the power of a deity, Sylvanus in the Celtic pantheon would still exist. The perspective I agree with most is that taken by the second edition supplement, Face and Avatars. In this supplement, it is stated that deities who exist in pantheons outside of Toril are the same deities as they are in the pantheons of Toril. In fact, if the same adventuring party from Toril kills Savannus under this perspective, they kill Savannus both in the Faerunian pantheon and the Celtic pantheon across any prime material worlds or planes where he is venerated. Though the supplement does stipulate, even then one has to be careful not to assume too much. Either way, I think a DM trying to adhere to canon is free to use their own perspective or an amalgam of both. It is important to note that when describing deities taken from our real-world religions, the authors do point out that they did take some liberties and creative freedoms with their descriptions. As it is, I know very little of anything about a real-world Celtic pantheon and belief system. I am just going to present what is in the D&D books and, and I will leave it to those who are far more knowledgeable to comment on what it is the D&D authors got correct or incorrect. Titles Sylvanus goes by the following titles in the Forgotten Realms. Oak Father, the Forest Father, Tree Father, the Old Oak, 
and Old Father Tree. Sylvanus goes by the following title in the Celtic Pantheon, The Long-Legged. Portfolio and Domains Sylvanus's portfolios in the Celtic Pantheon are Nature, Forests, and Druids. Sylvanus's portfolios in the Faerunian Pantheon are Wild, Nature, and Druids. Sylvanus's suggested domain for 5th edition is Nature both in the Faerunian and Celtic Pantheons. Appearance and Manifestations Sylvanus has two commonly described appearances. The first is known as the Old Father. This form is described as a wizened, bearded face that floats in midair between the trees or seemingly grows out of the trunk of a rather large and old tree. The skin of the Old Father is brown, green, and creviced much like old wood. His other form is known as the Young Strider. The Young Strider looks like a young man wearing scale mail. The scales of this armor are fashioned in the shape of an oak leaf. In this form, Sylvanus is seen wielding a maul that he has called the Great Mallet of Sylvanus. In 3rd edition terms, this mallet is a plus 5 maul with the energy aura, impact, and mighty cleaving abilities. With this mallet, Sylvanus knocks down dead trees to help prevent the spread of forest fires and to let them decompose into the earth. The young strider may be accompanied by a giant wolf as Sylvanus goes about. Sylvanus' avatars will bear either the form of the old father or the young strider. These avatars are known to appear when a sacred grove is under threat or when a circle of druids are attacked during worship. Sylvanus has three known manifestations. The first is an oak leaf on the wind seemingly out of nowhere. The second is is a manifestation produced by Sylvanus in order to take direct action on the prime material world without the need of an avatar. This manifestation consists of an eerie green glow and is often accompanied by the sound of whistling wind and running water. This manifestation often is used by Sylvanus to quench fires. The third and final manifestation is the Horned Man. The Horned Man is described as a man with stake horns protruding from, from their head, burning white eyes, and wearing a pelt of shaggy brown fur that looks similar to bark. The horror man never directly speaks, but can communicate telepathically to those he touches. The horn man has the capability of writing words with a simple point of his finger towards a given surface. He is also capable of moving, lifting, and throwing things around of considerable weight telekinetically. Most often, however, the horn man will appear to make a simple gesture at someone before fading away. Sylvanus can communicate his favor or disfavor through the appearance of various creatures. These include treants, brownies, dryads, deer, badgers, unicorns, atomies, satyrs, sprites, pixies, and other woodland creatures and monsters. Abilities As a greater deity, any role Sylvanus makes results in the highest possible result every time. He is an immortal being, and likely given his status as a greater deity, the procedures to kill less powerful deities may not even apply to him. Sylvanus's divine senses can reach out to a distance of 18 miles, which is roughly equivalent to 29 kilometers. His senses not only extend out from him, but also from any of his worshippers, places of worship, holy objects, or anywhere his name or one of his titles has been spoken within the last hour. What is more, Sylvanus can feel out with these divine senses up to 20 different places at once. If he wishes, Sylvanus may also block out the divine senses of any deity of a similar or lower rank at up to two remote locations for a maximum of 18 hours. Sylvanus' portfolio sense allows him to sense any disruption within the cycle of nature 1810 days or 180 days before it happens, while it is happening, or retains the sense for 8 and 10 days after such an event has transpired. He is also tapped into the actions and status of every druid throughout Faerun, and every wild animal who comes to be associated with the druidic circle that venerates him. Sylvanus is able to create any magic item, regardless of gold value, that is made from plant matter, animal matter, or is usable by druids. Sylvanus' avatar in his old father form 
Any of his spells related to plants, animals, and weather are cast at triple their normal effectiveness. Those who are targeted by such spells also suffer a negative 3 penalty to the rolls to save against these spells. The avatar is able to animate all plant life and fungi, both living and dead. They can also summon, command, and modify all different forms of wildlife. The Old Father avatar is also able to summon different sorts of fae, bestial, and plant creatures as well, being particularly fond of summoning treants. An avatar in the young strider form wields the great mallet of Sylvanus. This avatar is capable of calling down lightning, producing a torrent of water from their mouth, or summoning a wolfhound to help their cause. In the Celtic pantheon, Sylvanus is said to be able to control any number of flora and fauna found throughout the forest using his voice. He can also shrink or grow any plant life as he sees fit. Personal History as mentioned earlier, Sylvanus came to Toro at some time in the story past of the Freon Realms. He and Ogma seemingly found themselves being pushed out from the Celtic Pantheon, though the specifics of this conflict are never delved into. Nor is there really any myths that speak to how Sylvanus arrived to the Forgotten Realms. Legends speak to how Sylvanus has had control and authority over nature deities ever since his presence was felt on Toro and it is him who rewards or punishes those nature deities who exist under his authority. During the Time of Troubles in 1358 Dale Reckoning, Sylvanus reportedly was seen walking through the Winterwood and Shondawood. Here he was seen talking with elves during the night and dancing among the Fae. This led the Emerald Enclave to believe that their efforts in the Vilhan Reach region were favored by Sylvanus. Other than that, there is not much written about Sylvanus' activity on Toral. I do not think that means he is inactive. Just given that he is a deity of wild nature, much of what he does goes unseen or is understood by mortal eyes. Personality In both the Faerunian and Celtic pantheon, Sylvanus seemingly maintains the same bearing. In both pantheons, he is a neutrally aligned greater deity. True to his neutral alignment, Sylvanus can be seen as a caring and wise deity in some situations but aloof and uncaring in others, especially when it comes to those who face the wrath of nature as a result of their lack of concern for wild places. Savannah has a strong disdain for fire, and even more so for those who use fire carelessly or with the intent to destroy. Personal Realms In the Great Wheel cosmological model used in 1st edition, 2nd edition, and now as the assumed default model for 5th edition, Savannah resides on the plane commonly known as the Outlands. It is also known as the Concordant Opposition. It is the true neutral outer plane that is coterminous with every other outer plane. The Outlands can be said to be the center of the outer planes. Here, all the outer planes connect with the Outlands, and the Outlands serve as a neutral meeting ground. All sorts of planar beings walk op openly in the Outlands not bound to the different rules of the different planes that may restrict them as an outsider. In the middle of the Outlands is a massive spire visible to all in the Outlands, and above this spire rests Sigil, the city of doors. As one moves closer to this spire, powerful magical abilities begin to be neutralized. At the base of the spire, even deific powers cease. This great spire is regarded by some to be the axle around which all the outer planes spin. There is much more to be said about the Outlands, but I will keep it limited to this brief overview. The Celtic pantheon is largely represented in the Outlands in the realm known as Tirnaog. There are no mass settlements in Tirnaog. Rather, the partitioners live out in the wild, free to move among the different deific realms. Tirnaog is a beautiful green realm of meadows, hills, and oaken groves. There are all sorts of standing stones, obelisks, and cairns that dot the land that all seem to emanate ancient power. In Tirnaog, Sylvanus' personal realm is called Summer Oak. Summer Oak is a realm encompassed by the largest of all trees in the Great Wheel. These grand trees form a mighty forest. The canopy these trees form seemingly block all light from passing through up above. Along with the trees, every plant grows wild and unrestrained in summer oak. 
In the world tree models used in 3rd edition Forgotten Realms, Savannah's realm of the deep forest can be found on the plane of the House of Nature. The House of Nature is a plane full of wilderness without settlement or fortification. Here animals and humanoids live in peaceful coexistence. As time progresses, the humanoids here take on animalistic features and eventually turn into celestial animals themselves. This plane is protected by the neutral good celestial anthropomorphic beings known as Gardenals. Sylvanus' realm in the House of Nature is known as the Deep Forest. This realm is situated in the deep reaches of the plane where the vegetation grows wild and thick. Here the tallest trees soar up into the sky. The leaves from these trees form a thick canopy that blocks out the sky. Finally, in the World Axis cosmological model used in 4th edition, the realm of Sylvanus is known as the Deep Wilds. The terrain in this realm is far more varied compared to his other realms described in other cosmologies. This is representative, in my mind, of Sylvanus' portfolio over wild nature as a whole, not just woodlands. Multiple different biomes are found here rather than simply a deep and dense forest. No building or fortification is to be found within this realm. Still, the petitioners use the necessary tools to get by. Allies and Allegiances Sylvanus is served by a handful of nature deities in the Faeronian pantheon. These include Eldath and Myleki, then indirectly through Myleki, Gwerin, Winstrom, LaRue, and Shialia. Eldath and Myleki view Sylvanus as a paternal figure. Unlike some allied groups of deities, these nature deities do not have a group name. Sylvanus unsurprisingly has strong ties with Shantia, given the overlap of their portfolios. Other allies of Sylvanus include Lothander and Nobanayan. Enemies Sylvanus has a strong disdain for Talona, Malar, and Talos. Each of these three deities embody important aspects of nature. However, they are not concerned with maintaining the needed balance of all natural aspects in order to allow nature to flourish. So much so that the druids and clerics of Sylvanus refer to these three deities as the unbalanced. Another foe, though they are deceased, is Moander. Avatar and Deity Stat Blocks The second edition stat block for Savannah's avatar can be found in the supplement Face and Avatars. The third edition stat block for both Sylvanus and his avatar can be found in the supplement Face and Pantheons. Symbols In the Celtic Pantheon, Sylvanus's lone holy symbol is the Summer Oak. In the Faerunian Pantheon, Sylvanus has a few known holy symbols. The first and most well known is a vibrant green oak leaf. The rest, which are less known and used, are an oak tree in summer and a wooden staff with buds and new leaves poking through along its length. Central Dogma From 3rd Edition's Faiths and Pantheons Quote Savannah sees and balances all, meeting out wild water and drought, fire and ice, life and death. Hold your distance and take in the total situation, rather than latching on to the popular idea of what is best. All is in a cycle, deftly and beautifully balanced. It is the duty of the devout to see this cycle and the sacred balance as clearly as possible. Make others see the balance and work against those who would disturb it. Watch, anticipate, and quietly manipulate. Resort to violence and open confrontation only when pressured by time or hostile action. Fight against the felling of forests, banish disease wherever you find it, defend the trees, and plant new flora wherever possible. Seek out, serve, and befriend the dryads and learn their names. Kill only when needful, destroy fire and its employers, and beware orcs and others who bring axes into the forest. End quote. Presence of the Faith Savannah is most commonly worshipped by druids, woodsmen, rangers, rural forest communities, herbalists, and a fair amount of wood elves. His worshippers extend across a wide breadth of alignments, being chaotic neutral, lawful neutral, neutral, neutral evil, and neutral good. Centaurs who reside in Faerun prominently favor Savannah as their patron deity. Some amount of Thrycreen also worships Savannah as well. 
The Vladni or Pine Folk of the Great Dale are said to be a byproduct of a long ago deal between a lord from Narfal and Sylvanus himself. In exchange for a refuge and sanctuary within the forested region, they would have to do away with their humanity and bring the blood of the forest into them. The Vlani are strong adherents to the Sylvanite faith to the point of being a little too zealous at times in combating the expansion and encroachment on the forest. A common misconception about the Sylvanite faith is that they value the life of flora and fauna over that of humanoids. Often his tenants and his faith get misconstrued and lumped in with the deities of fury. This easily gets misconstrued considering Sylvanus' negative feelings towards the encroachment of humanoid development. Sylvanus' clergy is most often found living amongst small rural communities or secluded away in the wild places of Faerun, though there are a fair amount who do live within urban areas. Sylvanite clergy called the Greenleaf Priesthood given the oak leaf holy symbol used in veneration of Sylvanus. Sylvanite worship is prominent in the lands south and east of Tethir, Osla, as well as in Lurin. The Vilhan Reach region also has a large Sylvanite presence and influence as well. Long ago, when the Reach was plagued by disease, the Sylvanite clergy did much to help feed and heal the sick here. For this reason alone, the Sylvanite faith is well regarded. Clergy advise the rulers here. Every settlement has a temple or shrine to Sylvanus and the clergy who reside in these settlements keep the waters pure, free of charge. The Sylvanite faith has ties with the Harpers. Sylvanus was one of the deities to appear in support in the free formation of the Harpers back in 720 Dale Reckoning. A good number of Sylvanite clerics are members themselves. The rest of the faith have helped to support the Harpers by ensuring certain woodland refuges, campsites, and meeting places are protected and watched over. Hierarchy and Structure of the Clergy The divide between the Sylvanite clergy is much like Shantia's. Druids live out in the wild areas of the world, while clerics, priestesses, and priests tend to Sylvanite holy sites within the confines of a settlement. The difference being that Sylvanus shows favoritism towards the Druids over the clergy residing in settlements, whereas Shantia is unbiased and supports all members of her clergy equally. The majority of Sylvanite clergy are made up of Druids. These druids either work by themselves within a given druid circle and or with groups of rangers. The druids exist in a hierarchy much like other druidic circles, with an archdruid acting as the leader for one or more circles. From there, each archdruid reports to a grand druid who presides over a given region. Then at the very top is the great druid who all grand druids report to. The position of great druid is not occupied for more than a few years after which time the Great Druid retires to become an elder of the faith. Clerics, priests, priestesses, and rangers operate outside of this druidic hierarchy and support. The clergy go by many different names, two of them given to them from common folk, being stag lords and forest masters. The names they have given to themselves are tenders of the forest, balancers, and oak servants. Responsibilities and duties of clergy and worshippers the Sylvanite clergy often work hand-in-hand with the clergies of Eldath and Myleki. This is understandable given the personal relationships between their respective deities and purview over nature. Some of the chief responsibilities of the Sylvanite clergy are breeding wildlife, healing sick and wounded animals, and planting trees and shrubs where they were once removed. This is the public-facing image the faith wants the lay folk to associate their faith with. However, the Sylvanite clergy may covertly sponsor and support brigands in order to slow or stop the encroachment of hunting and logging into their lands. Likewise, they may place or redirect dangerous predators towards such encroachment. Sylvanite druids, as well as those who can also change into beast form or tree form, are encouraged to do so occasionally so as to be able to experience their wild surroundings as fully as possible. These forms also allow them to get away from enemies as well as eavesdrop on them unknowingly. Such things are done secretly so as to appear as neutral as possible. Sylvanite clergy are taught to think for the long term whenever weighing a given action and or situation. Specifically, to consider how things might come to throw off the balance that Sylvanus wishes to maintain. By being patient and examining how certain things come to affect the cycle of life, 
Silver Knight clergy can gauge how best to approach certain situations. If they are working along willing woodcutters, they make sure that new trees are put in place of those that are cut down. Also that the woodcutters target those trees specifically that are dying or diseased. Commercially, the faith produces alternatives to wood as a fire source. These alternatives include slow-burning platter candles, peat and manure cakes, charcoal from falling wood, and flammable oils. Orders and Priestly Bodies There are no knightly or holy body of warriors in the Sylvanite faith. Though the faith does hold a deep alliance with the different orders of rangers present in Myleki's faith. The Emerald Enclave based out of the Vilhan Reach on the island of Ilahan is primarily made up of Sylvanite druids. They have cells that operate in other wild places of Faerun, such as the High Forest, Cormanthor, and the Forest of the Great Dale. This group is viewed with some skepticism by other members of the Sylvanite faith given the view that the Emerald Enclave is a touch too radical compared to other ra- uh, Sylvanite circles. As it is, the Sylvanite faith proper does not ally itself with the Enclave, but also does not denounce at the, their actions at the same time. After all, if the Sylvanite members were acting against the will of Sylvanus, they would have lost their powers long ago. The members of the Emerald Enclave are referred to as caretakers. Their focus isn't on the conflict between good and evil, evil, but rather on curtailing the expansion of urban development and encroachment into the wild places of the world. This is not to say that they are against development entirely, just that it doesn't go unchecked without consideration for the natural world. The Enclave is divided up into circles, with each circle landing somewhere in a hierarchy of responsibilities. At the very top of the Enclave is the Elder Circle, made up of only three members. These three members are chosen of Myleki, Sylvanus, and Eldath. Their base of operations is the House of Sylvanus on Ilicon. Green Lords and Green Ladies are especially a group of clergy who ardently protect wildlife, often in conflict with those who look to develop inwards into such wild spaces. They ensure that the expansion of developing groups does not exceed their means. They will sabotage endeavors to push into wild spaces should the need arise. However, they will never kill those who are making their way into wild places of the world. To do so would to be against the very teachings that they hold dear. The Druids of Tall Trees are a group of secretive and reclusive Druids and their associates. They are mostly dedicated to Myleki, but some among them worship Eldath or Sylvanus. They reside in the northeastern region of the High Forest. A member looking to join the Druids is likely to be approached from the outside by a ranger or other agent acting on behalf of the Tall Trees Druids. They will usually be set up with a small task to gauge your competence. From there, the individual will be tasked with objectives of greater importance until they are allowed to come to Tall Trees itself. Greater successes will only then lead to an eventual invitation to join the group. The Knightswood Nine is a Sylvanite circle dwelling in the King's Forest of Cormir. Here they ensure no unlawful logging goes on and allow the flora and fauna here to flourish. The Nine are all older human males led by a man named Dragoth Endrun. Forest Masters are not a formalized Sylvanite group. Instead, they are those who come to embrace the nature all around them, so much so that they become some aspect of a humanoid plant hybrid. Forest masters are defenders of the ancient and pristine woods of Faerun. They often are druids, but sometimes rangers and clerics become forest masters as well. Appearance and Dress Notable amongst the Sylvanite clergy is a scale mail and leather armor they wear ceremonially. The scales or green tinted leather is fashioned in such a way to resemble oak leaves. Typically clerics wear the scale mail and the druids wear the leather armor. They both wear green breeches and a green shirt over top their armor. Their large ceremonial helmets are adorned with oak leaf shaped wings coming off the sides. This outfit is often simplified by those in urban settings to a copper pin placed on the chest when not involved in ceremony. While adventuring, the ceremonial dress may be worn or a clergy member may wear something less inconspicuous. Most will wear clothing and armor most appropriate to the situation and environment. 
Druids found in the wild areas of Faerun have taken to wearing a brown cloak made from various hides. They adorn these cloaks with feathers and water down clumps of moss that they change from day to day. On their legs and feet they wear fur leggings or high boots. Green ladies and green lords wear leather armor decorated with different nature motifs pressed into the leather. Often these motifs are pressed to look like various sorts of leaves. They also wear green cloaks, a bronze torque with green gemstones on its ends, and a simple tan tunic. They usually carry a wooden staff as their only weapon. Rituals Sylvanite clerics prepare their spells either at sundown or when the moon is out. The holy days in the faith are green grass between the monks of Tarsak and Myrtle, midsummer between the monks of Flamerol and Alesis, and high harvest tide between the monks of Aelaint and Marpanoth. During these days, the clergy meditate and commune with Sylvanus. The night the forest walks is not a set holy day. Rather, Sylvanus is known to grow restless at times, and on these days he causes all aspects of nature to seemingly move under their own volition. Trees move, streams will change course, caves will either open or close, forest-dwelling monsters are roused, and in general, magic tied to nature is stronger when such events occur. When giving worship to Sylvanus, a sacrifice needs to be given. The sacrifice comes in the form of the broken remains of a wooden object. The wooden debris from this broken object is then buried. The call of oak, ash, and thorn is a prayer made out to Sylvanus. The leaves of three different types of trees are first gathered. The leaves are then floated out on top of water. Then the prayer itself is said to Sylvanus. A ritual simply known as a vigil is carried out when direct communication with a servant of Sylvanus is required or when asking for specific divine power from Sylvanus. The participant will cover themselves in a paste-like mixture made from ground-up acorns and mistletoe with spraying water or rainwater. The participant then lays or places themselves in contact with a living tree during the night. The ritual dictates that the flesh of the participant must be touching moss, so often moss-covered trees are marked and remembered for when the time comes to carry out such vigils. The thorn call is a ritual often performed by the Silonite clergy. This is a defensive ritual that raises up barriers of thorn throughout the forest. These barriers form labyrinthine passages. This is done when a servant of Sylvanus is found dead out in the wild. The Song of Trees is one of the two most holiest and powerful rituals in the faith. During the Song of Trees, a chant with haunting and repetitive lyrics is sung. The power of this ritual is stronger depending on the amount of Sylvanites participating in it. Harmed woodland creatures are drawn in by this ritual and are healed. Damaged and diseased trees are also healed, and in rare, and in rare instances, some fallen trees may come to stand upright once more. The Dryad Dance is the other most powerful ri- ritual. This ritual is one of di- revelry, dance, and music. This calls out the dryads from hiding among the woods for a month after the dance is performed. The trees the dryads live in come to be healed. It is not unheard of for the dryads to mate with those who perform the dance, which helps to spread the growth of new trees and new dryads. General locations of places of worship. Sylvanite rituals out in the wild tend to take place amongst a stand of ancient and tall trees, which are usually oak trees, or standing stone rings found deep within the forest of Faerun. Urban places of worship shape the grounds that they are given to recreate a wild forest as best they can. Here, clergy preach about the tranquility and untouched aspects of nature. They also give out the various herbs and plants that are helpful or safe to consume. That or shrines to Sylvanus are established around a grove of oak trees within the settlement or on the settlement's outskirts. In rural areas where oak trees may not grow, A symbol of the oak leaf may be carved into the wood of another type of tree to signify a holy place for the Sylvanite faith. Specific Locations of Places of Worship The Druids of Tall Trees reside in the northeastern region of the High Forest. This region is known in Elven as Tuvia Manthar, where the remnants of an ancient Elven civilization known as Erlan once flourished. Here, colossal trees ascend overhead and are likely the source of the name given to this place. 
The druids of tall trees act to preserve what remains of Erlon and to keep out those who seek out ancient loot and lore alike. They live amongst the branches and trunks of these massive trees where the moon elf population once lived. Now they support those elves who have returned in the hopes of rejuvenating a new elven civilization in the high forest. The Knightswood Nine, mentioned earlier, live in the King's Forest of Cormier. They are said to live in an underground home made beneath a hollow tree. They also are said to have a series of caverns linked to their home in which they farm and cultivate various forms of fungi. Reportedly, the most prominent place of Sylvanite worship is Old Oak Dell, found in the heart of the forest of Tethyr. In this forest, even the elves have taken to worshipping the forest deity. Here a balance is struck between the worship of Sylvanus and Eldath to show both the power and peacefulness, peacefulness of nature. Another prominent place of worship that may yet stand to exceed the old oak dell is Lion's Oak. Lion's Oak, found in Impilter, is a forest grown by Sylvanite clergy. To the south and east of Tethyr, Sylvanite worship is very popular. The Oak Father's Glen in Brost is a Sylvanite temple housed in a large petrified oak tree. Sylvanite worship is almost equally as strong on the island of Illicon, where the Emerald Enclave is based. Here, the Oaken Hall, also known as the House of Sylvanus, is the largest temple to Sylvanus in the Vilhan Reach. This temple is the base of operations for the Emerald Enclave. Oaken Hall is an open concept structure made of wood and stone with water all around it. In order to make your way into the house, a person must proceed over a series of stepping stones. Before the dancing place in the Highdale became an important holy site to the Harpers, it once served as a holy grove in the Sylvanite faith. It still serves as a pilgrimage site for several Sylvanite pilgrims. Sylvanites also reside at the dancing place to tend to it alongside a handful of of other members from other faiths. The Oak House in Quaidarvar is a temple found among a stand of old trees. The open concept temple is housed in the tree trunks of trees that have fallen over. The clergy live around the temple within the forest. Here they work alongside the loggers of the settlement, instructing them as to what trees to cut down. The sacred grove of Sylvanus in Grunwald provides free healing to locals. They offer their healing services to others, though at a steep cost. The 17th centuries is a ring of standing stones that is thought to be an active grove for Sylvanite worship. This ring can be found a day's ride from Perskul, and those that sleep in the ring seemingly are protected by wild creatures. The Oaken Grove Abbey to Sylvanus can be found in the Elvenwood, 20 miles away from Ashbenford. This walled-off abbey protects an ancient grove sacred to their faith. The stone wall encompasses a mile-wide circular enclosure of wild and vibrant plant life. The unnamed shrine to Sylvanus in Waterdeep can be found in the Seaward District alongside a shrine to Myleki. Together, these shrines are known as the Shrines of Nature. The complex surrounding both shrines contains its own forested environment. The Unicorn Run, which is more so synonymous with Myleki and LaRue, is still held to be a holy site where Sylvanus is also said to show up in animal form from time to time. Several druids have visions that tell them to come here on pilgrimage to seek divine guidance. The Jundar Wood, found at the base of Mount Gorant, is named after a wizard turned Sylvanite who came to this forest to help increase the numbers of threatened monstrosities natural in the wild. Followers of Malar believe the Jundar Wood to be sacred to Malar, given the monstrosities that roam inside it. However, it has been made clear that they are not welcome as several among their numbers turn up dead and torn to pieces. There is a rumor of a stake-headed man who patrols this forest, and folks often believe this to be some manifestation of or is Sylvanus himself. The two massive forests found in the Great Dale, the Rollins Wood, and the Forest of Lothir hold a strong Sylvanite presence within them. The Vladni or Pine people, who are adamant worshippers of Sylvanus, live within these forests. The Circle of Leth, who patrols and protects both of these forests predominantly, are made of Sylvanites. The Nentyark, the Archdruid of the Circle of Leth, currently lives within the forest of Lothir, and is currently locked in conflict with the Druids of Talona, led by a chosen of Talona known as the Rotting Man, who is based out of the Rawlingswood. 
Named temples to Savannas include the Deep Glade and Tall Trees, the Silver Glen and Silvery Moon, and God's Grove near, near Wheeloon. Unnamed temples to Savannas can be found in Throldar, Alakon, Holondeth, Ormoth, Lekholm, Ormpatar, Erebar, Reth, and Loudwater. Unnamed shrines to Savannas can be found in Arkendale, Tasseldale, Battledale, Tilverton, Dragon Falls, Elven Tree, Four shrines found amongst the Misty Forest, Iljak, Haloth, Nun, Ermel, Alver's Lance, Banathar, Dauntshield, Swords Lake Creek, Assembra, and within the Yearwood. Character Options For 2nd edition, an option for Sylvanite Crusaders and the breakdown for the Green Lady slash Green Lord Priest can be found in the Warriors and Priests of the Realm supplement. For 3rd edition, the Forest Master Prestige class can be found in the Face and Pantheon supplement. The Initiate of Nature feat can be found in the Player's Guide to Faerun. For 4th edition, in the Forgotten Realms Player's Guide, there is a Chosen of Sylvanas Utility Power and the Channel Divinity Blessing of Sylvanas Feat Power. The following is a breakdown of the features that I think someone deeply involved in Sylvanas' faith as an accolade or otherwise would have for the background in 5th edition. For the two skill proficiencies, I would take Animal Handling and Nature. For the language or tool proficiencies given by a background, I would give them Sylvan proficiency as well as Herbalism kit proficiency. For the equipment that they get, I would take the Acolytes from the Player's Handbook or the Hermit or Outlanders from the Player's Handbook, though using the respective gold that both of these backgrounds get to also purchase a lovely symbol at the outset. Finally, for the ribbon feature that each background gets, obviously there's always the Acolytes Shelter of the Faithful, but at the same time there's the Hermit's Discovery and the Outlander's Wanderer features. Next is just a series of subclasses that I think would be thematically appropriate for a NPC to take, or a PC to take, if they are a worshipper of Sylvanas. For the Barbarian, there's the Totem Warrior from the Player's Handbook. For the Cleric, there's the Nature Domain from the Player's Handbook. For the druid, kind of bandied this about in my mind back and forth, and really I came to the conclusion that all the druid subclasses would work in various different contexts. So these would include the Circle of the Land and Moon from the Player's Handbook, Circle of Dreams and Shepherd from Xanthar's Guide to Everything, and the Circle of Spores from the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. For the Paladin, Sylvanas has some ties with the Fae. I'm not too sure how strong they are. That's kind of really up to you how you go about describing that, but there is the Oath of the Ancients Paladin in the Player's Handbook. For the Ranger, much like the Druid, I kind of thought about this, and at the end I thought probably all the Ranger subclasses would work, um, some more clearly than others, but there's an argument to be made for all of them. So that would include the Beastmaster and Hunter from the Player's Handbook, and the Gloomstalker, Monster Slayer, and Horizon Walker from Xanthar's Guide to Everything. For the Rogue, there's the Scout from Xanthar's Guide to Everything. For the Sorcerer, there's the Divine Soul Sorcerer from Xanthar's Guide to Everything. For the Warlock, much like the Paladin, um, the ties that Sylvanas might have with the Fae are not explicitly stated, but there definitely could be an angle you take where you play an Arch Fae Patron Warlock, which can be found in the Player's Handbook. Dungeon Master Options First, I'd like to mention monsters and what sources they can be found in from official 5th edition sources that would be of use to you as a Dungeon Master if you are trying to represent those creatures that are allies or tied in with Sylvanas' faith. From the Monster Manual, you have the Awakened Shrub, the Awakened Tree, the Centaur, the Dryad, Satyr, Sprite, Treant, and Unicorn. After that, there are many woodland creatures in the Monster Manual that would be all tied to Sylvanas. Rather than list them all needlessly, just know that if it's a creature found in a woodland environment, Sylvanas and his faith would make use of them. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there's the Thorny and Woodwode. From Tales from the Yawning Portal, there's the Thorn Slinger. 
From Horde of the Dragon Queen, there's the Golden Stag. From Rise of Tiamat, there's the Carnivorous Flower. From Dungeon of the Mad Mage, there's a stat block for the Crow. For Explorer's Guide, from Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount, there's the Guardian Wolf. From Waterdeep Dragon Heist, there's the Falcon. From Tomb of Annihilation, there's the Assassin Vine and Tri Flower Frond. Two creatures that were mentioned earlier in the podcast that kind of are tied in with Savannah's Faith, but don't currently have a 5th edition official stat block are Brownies and Atomies. Uh, brownies are small creatures who tend to live in pastoral regions of a given world. They like to engage in many different helpful tasks for someone who they have deemed to be of good standing, so long as they receive some sort of food or, and or milk in exchange. They are said to me to maybe be the distant cousins to halflings. Brownies rely on their inherent magics in order to get out of a tight spot. You can find a stat block for the brownie in 1st edition's Monster Manual and 2nd edition's Monstrous Manual. Atomies are another type of fairy creature, much like the pixie or the sprite. Being one of the smallest varieties of fairies, they are extremely fast and nimble. Atomies are described to have dragonfly-like wings, and features similar to that of wood elves. They make their settlements and homes up in the branches of hardwood trees, having a preference for oak trees. You can find a stat block for the Atomy in 1st edition's Monster Manual 2 and 2nd edition's Monstrous Manual. To round out this section on monsters, the following are just a list of humanoid NPC stat blocks to represent various Sylvanite worshippers and clergy. Keep in mind with the spellcasters, you can always swap out their listed spells for other spells more fitting to the themes and people you're trying to represent. From the Monster Manual, there is the Acolyte, Priest, Druid, and Scout stat blocks. From Mordecai's Tome of Foes, there is the Total Druid. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there is the Arch Druid and Archer. From Out of the Abyss, there is the Emerald Enclave Scout. From the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, there is the Druid of the Old Ways. From the Mystic Odysseys of Theros, there is the Satyr Reveler and the Satyr Thornbearer. This, these two stat blocks should have been in the Monster section previously, but I mentioned them here just so I cover that mistake I made. In Storm King's Thunder, there is a stat block for a generic Wood Elf. And finally, of in Tomb of Annihilation, there is a stat block for a Tabaxi Hunter. Let's take a look at magic items associated with Sylvanus. The Book of Numb the Mad is a druidic prayer book put together by a druid of Sylvanus who was not unstable as his nickname would suggest, just eccentric. This spell book consists of 24 loose leaf pages sandwiched in between two flat pieces of ironwood and held together with a leather thong. Greater details in the contents of this tome can be found in the 1st edition supplement Forgotten Realms Camping Setting box. Now, Leaves of Green is a holy tome in the Sylvanite faith that resembles an oval-shaped piece of dark gray bark. Despite its fragile appearance, it seemingly cannot be broken by anything. What type of tree this piece of bark comes from is unknown by even knowledgeable druids. The only discernible feature to let the casual observer know that something is different about this piece of bark is a carving of three circles forming a triangle on the inside surface of the bark. In order to activate this tome, a person must press down on all three circles while, invo- while invoking the name of one of Sylvanus's titles. This will cause the bark to grow and open up essentially to reveal a book made out of square waxy leaves of green. Each page contains a spell, and there are 16 pages in this tome. The origins of this holy tome are unknown. Though the legends say it was recovered from the ruins of Netheril long ago by a wealthy Harulian family. Its last known location was in Ereabor in 1367 Dale Reckoning, where a higher sword showed it off at an inn. Further details on the leaves of green can be found in the second edition supplement, Prayers from the Faithful. Next in our discussion on magic items are a list of thematically appropriate items from official 5th edition sources I feel the Faith of Sylvanus may have access to or make use of. From the Dungeon Master's Guide, there are the various bag of tricks, the eyes of the eagle, the various figurines of wondrous power, the periapt of proof against poison, the potion of animal friendship, potion of poison resistance, 
the following Qual's Feather Tokens, Tree and Bird, Quiver of Ilona, they'll change the name from Ilona to something more realms related, Ring of Animal Influence, Ring of Poison Resistance, Staff of Swarming Insects, Staff of the Adder, Staff of the Python, and Staff of the Woodlands. From Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, you could reskin a Goldgari Guild Signet, as well as reskin a Selesnya Key Rune. From Tales from the Yawning Portal, there's the Eagle Whistle and Wand of Entangle. From Eberron, Rising from the Last War, there's the Feather Token. From Ghosts of Solve Marsh, there's the Charm of Plant Command. Finally, from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, there's the Bead of Nourishment, Bead of Refreshment, and Staff of Bird Calls. Alright, thank you for listening to Religion in the Realms. If you're interested in keeping up with the release of future episodes, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and follow the podcast Twitter account at Realms Religion. These episodes are also uploaded to YouTube as well. Audio versions of the podcast can be found on Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play Podcasts. If you wish to get in touch with me with any questions or just want to chat, my personal Twitter handle is at ShivsEmbrace, or you can send an email to realmsreligion at gmail.com, all in lowercase. In the next episode, we will be continuing on with our look at the woodland nature deities with an episode on Myliki, the neutral good goddess of the forest. Until next time, may Timora look kindly upon your dice rolls, Helm protect you, and Lathander light your path. Music for this episode. The Sky of Our Ancestors by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0.